Hello everyone and welcome to another Top Tips for Archaeology graduates. Today I am joined by Rosemary. Hi Rosemary, how are you? Hi Penny, yes great, thank you, really good to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. So Rosemary was one of the first graduates from the archaeology department at York and I shan't, shan't say when she graduated to, um, because it was a while ago now, for, particularly for our current graduates. But Rosemary is also a qualified solicitor and now senior legal counsel um, in the company that she works for um, and has agreed to join us today to talk a little bit about some of the older days of archaeology but also her career in law as well. So Rosemary, could you tell us a little bit about your job role now and what it entails? Yes, sure. So the company that I work for Accenture is a global technology company. So if you just think of, you know, all kinds of exciting technology that's coming into our lives now, the digital age, all based on data, um, tailored advertising, tailored goods and services, phones that talk to each other and talk to our products in our homes and so on. That's the kind of space that Accenture operates in, as well as more basic kind of outsourcing services like application maintenance, the, the call center that you might speak to when your laptop breaks down or something like that. Um, so obviously I work in the legal team within Accenture. Um, so what that means is basically it's our job to help Accenture put in place contracts with its clients. So you can imagine we're selling all kinds of services in the UK to clients here. And in order to, um, to do that work for our clients, we need a contract. And that's where my team comes in. So we spend a lot of time talking to clients, working with deal teams and negotiating terms and conditions so that both parties are happy, um, covering all kinds of things like payment, intellectual property, um, what exactly are we going to do? What is the client going to do? Um, and then hopefully that, that then makes a really good basis and platform for the relationship for the work to actually be done. Um, my role now actually is more around um, helping other people do their deals. So I, I spend a lot of time supervising people in my team and helping coach them in their job um, rather than actually getting stuck in and doing deal work myself. <clears throat> so that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it sounds like you work a lot with other people. You spend a lot of time working alongside other people and, and speaking to people during the day and things like that. It must be a very kind of people heavy role. Absolutely. And actually our main, you know, we're a services company. So what that means is it's all about people, um, you know, people who talk to clients. I'm talking to clients. I'm, um, as you said, you know, talking to my team members. Most of it is about meetings of one variety or another. Um, but meetings with a technical content, um, because that's one thing that I've always really enjoyed about being a lawyer and enjoyed about my job is that actually it has a real intellectual content. Um, you know, dr drafting and negotiating contracts and understanding deal structures and the, the um, commercial, commercial arrangements around the deal. Um, coming you know working through some really quite tricky issues it has it has a good a good chunk of intellectual brain power needed um and that's something that i've really always enjoyed in my career so, so the kind of critical analysis i guess that you need in order to be able to do that must be um i mean it must be quite taxing at times as well uh, especially if you've got a kind of tricky problem to chew over so can I ask what what are the things that you find more challenging about your role yes well spot on actually I mean it's it's great to have an intellectual challenge it's not it's not so great if you're trying to do that at 11 o'clock at night or against a really tight deadline and mm. um, you know that that actually can be quite stressful and it sort of tip, can tip over then from being enjoyable to just feeling stressful because you're trying to assimilate and analyze a lot of information, explain it to other people in a way they can understand, 
and try and kind of come to a consensus with your colleagues, maybe also with the client about how to address it. And um, doing that kind of thing under time pressure can be quite hard. Um, sometimes I think in the law generally, you know, I think it's, it's a very rewarding area to work, but it's probably no surprise to anybody that um, long hours um, and, you know, a lot of demands on you from clients are a feature generally of being a lawyer. Um, there's, there's also a bit of an expectation on lawyers that they have to be be perfect you know people come to a lawyer they might if you're working in a law firm they're probably paying you a lot of money um, for your advice and you don't want to get it wrong you don't want to make a mistake um, but it's not possible to go through your career and your life without making a mistake it's just not possible we're human and also quite often you might not have all the information um, as I said you might be up against a tight deadline etc so those are generally the areas of, of legal work that can be quite challenging, I think. <clears throat> Is it fair to say that you think it's if someone, I guess some people do thrive on time pressure and having deadlines. Do you think it's something that that someone who kind of enjoys that kind of working to a deadline, you know, working under those kinds of conditions would enjoy? Is it that that kind of role? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think um, I think people up to a point, I think it is enjoyable working to a deadline. You get a real sense of achievement when you've when you've closed the deal, when you've done that thing, whatever it is, or when you've met that milestone. Um, you get that real sense of achievement and pulling everything together. Um, I think it's just sometimes it can just get get too much. And especially when you, you get tired, you know, it's hard to keep that that momentum and that focus going but but overall you know I think if I think in any job you need some kind of you need a bit of pressure honestly to really to really motivate you and get get it going it can it can actually be feel more like excitement rather than stress at that point mm -hmm. so I think it's valuable in any job it's when it tips over into being completely you know too much yeah. then obviously that's not enjoyable and you don't want can be useful because you kind of learn how to deal with those situations and you learn I think you learn in your career how to manage you know you learn what, what you're good at what you what you can cope with what you're not so good at how to manage those situations um, as you go along you learn that to manage that so those are all good life skills <clears throat> yeah yeah um so can I ask how you you got into your current role a little bit tell us a little bit about I guess your journey from studying archaeology and history as it was back in those days through to to your role now uh yes well it's been it's been quite a long journey um I suppose maybe to start with you know why did I not stay in archaeology that was a really tough decision at the time it was you know, I, I mean, I really loved my study. I really loved archaeology. But ultimately, I felt that I needed more of a structure um, for my, you know, to go out into the world of work. I needed more of a structure. I've, I think I, I kind of concluded that doing a professional qualification would give me that structure and also maybe give me that confidence. Um, because actually, I mean, I think things have changed now, but I didn't have very much work experience um, before I graduated. I had some, but not in the extent people do now. Um, and so I, that's the decision I made. It was quite heartbreaking, but, uh, but um, I, overall, looking back on it, I still feel it was the right decision for me. Um, and so I then I have to say, really in my case it was more a question of going through a process of elimination about what I wanted to do rather than knowing okay so now I'm going to be a lawyer it wasn't really like that for me in fact I, I started off as a trainee accountant which um, you know it kind of became fairly obvious fairly early on that, that wasn't the right thing for me um, but um, 
one element of what I had to study was law. And I realized that actually the law was the thing that I found most comfortable with and most interested in. And so that kind of then took me off in that direction. Um, but I did go and work in a law firm first before as a paralegal, before I went to law school, because I didn't want to kind of make another wrong turn, um, so to speak. Um, so, so then I um, went to law school, qualified um, in a medium commercial practice in London, um, initially actually doing dispute work, commercial dispute work, so completely different to what I'm doing now. Um, um, but then at, at a certain point, it was kind of a question of where do I want my career to go now? And I decided that um, I would prefer to work in an in-house role and get have a change of scene really go go into looking more about you know understanding more about the business what businesses do how they work and how how I could help there um I was actually very fortunate to get the chance to switch during my career from doing dispute work to doing the kind of work I'm doing now which is um you know putting deals together um that is one feature actually of the profession and maybe other professions that it's very easy to get pigeonholed quite early on and it's not then so easy to to switch um so that that was um an opportunity which i took um and which worked out really well for me and I think that's one thing that, you know, is important about one's career that, you know, to develop your career is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, you kind of think when you leave university or I did, well, I'll have a job and that's kind of it. But <laughs> you actually got to carry on in the world of work for a lot longer than that. And so, you know, being open to open to opportunities that come along, um, being curious, being having an agility actually and thinking about, well, you know, here's an opportunity, maybe I should take this and see where that takes me. Um, being open to that and kind of developing that way, I think is, is actually, you know, a good way of looking at your career. <clears throat> I think there's some wonderful, wonderful advice. The marathon, not a sprint, which is, is I think, very, very true. But also how, you know, you tried one direction and that actually brought you to where you are now by enjoying, you know, finding out that law was what you enjoyed of, of something that didn't work out. And I think, I think, like you say, sometimes it appears to students or it appears to graduates, particularly speaking to people who are perhaps successful in their careers, that it's been a straight line from point A to finishing, if you like, but there's no finish line. And like you, I've had a few other experiences in my in my career and, and they've all in some ways led to where I am now, but they've not all been sort of a step on the ladder, if you like, it's been more of a squiggly, uh, unstraight really? route. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And actually, um, another thing I would say is that one of my mantras for any of the interns that come and work with us in Accenture is nothing is ever wasted. You know, I mean, I spoke about um, my foray into accountancy as a kind of wrong turn, but actually I learned so much from that, which did come in useful in my legal career. I understood because I'd done some audit work, basically, I understood more about businesses, how they work, um, there was also an accountancy paper that I had to sit for the for the for the law exam actually. So hey, you know I'd already done that bit. Um, <laughs> but nothing is ever wasted. I mean that's just one example. So never feel disheartened if things don't go exactly according to your master plan. You know it will always come back and be useful mm -hmm. later on in some way that probably at the time you can't you know you can't imagine. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. So can I ask you um, uh, to think back to when you were in York uh, as part of that first cohort who graduated with archaeology degrees, what did you find useful about your degree and what now as, as you get further on in your career do you look back at sort of archaeology and, and, and think about now that you took out of it? Yes, I mean I, I think um, 
one of the things I would say is the confidence to try new things. I mean, that's where I started out with my thinking when I applied to do archaeology. I'd always been interested, knew nothing really about it, other than big, picking up bits of pots in my parents' garden and trying to fit them together. <laughs> yeah, um, so many people start there. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. never fitted, bizarrely, but anyway. Um, so... You know, I, I I could have done I could have done history, I could have done French, I could have done English, but that was my comfort zone. I knew how to study those things. So studying archaeology, you know, it really took me out of you know learning new things um, and having the confidence, therefore, in the future that I'd done that before. I'd taken on a subject before that I didn't know anything about, and I had made that work. Um, so you know. The fact that we had to do practical stuff out of doors, photography, uh, surveying, all of those skills that they're quite niche, but it, it just meant that later on in life, in my career, you know, it's like, well, I, I can do anything if I put my <laughs> mind to it. Um, so there was that. Um, also, actually, one of the things that I found the most useful was as part of our degree, I don't know if it's the case now, but we had to do a lecture and we had to run a seminar, yeah. and, which was utterly terrifying at the time. But those are amazingly transferable skills. I mean, the number of times in my, I mean, I now have a training role anyway. I have to, you know, deliver lots of training to lots of people. Um, um, but I've had to give talks to clients, you know, I've had to run meetings, um, you, you know, and sort of manage, manage all kinds of situations the same. And the fact that I'd done that before I started work definitely helped me. Again, it's a confidence thing. You know, you've done it before. Um, um, I suppose also just, um, I mean, I've I've never lost interest in archaeology. So, you know, just just at that life level, it stayed with me. I I haven't been able to keep up as much as I would like because I just don't have time re realistically. But you know, I've kept it as um, I've kept it as an interest ever since. Um, and it's interesting that. Um, you know, I now work in a technology firm, as I said. I mean, you might think actually, well, it's kind of completely unrelated, but one of our, our, our CEO was recently talking about our mission, if you like, is to, is to deliver on the promise of um, technology and human ingenuity. And when I heard that, I thought, well, that's archaeology, you know, that's <laughs> what archaeology is about, looking yeah. back at at the, at the intersection between technology and human ingenuity. So. You know, it is actually looking at some fundamental things about how people are, how societies work. I mean, those le those those insights are really valuable in any situation. Oh, well, how wonderful! I think that's a really nice way to capture our archaeology as human ingenuity and and sort of technological development and how those two things fix fix together. And we we still have the assessed lectures and the assessed seminars. Our third year still still do that. So they were right there right. at the beginning and it's still a fundamental part of the way we teach because we do recognize that as you say it's confidence building for students they really help helps them and and also uh teaching the seminar I think you get to pick the subjects that really matter to you through doing those things and you get a chance to sort of say say what matters to you so can I ask finally as my last question um what top tips would you give to graduates who perhaps wanted to follow it in your footsteps into the law or just in general in terms of, of, of what comes after you've graduated from your degree yeah um I think um one of the things that I had to learn, uh, um, you know, was that it actually makes sense to think about what is it you really enjoy doing. And it sounds such a banal thing to say, but um, and then follow that. So, you know, um, for, for example, I in the end, I chose to get, when I was um, working out which firms to apply to for my training contract. 
I decided not to go to one of the big firms because by then I'd worked out that actually I'm not wasn't really a big firm person and that I, I preferred being in an environment which was a bit more a bit more friendly you know smaller where I could really shine actually um, not everybody you know it sounds very flashy to go to the the, the big firm with um, thousands of employees and the big name um, doesn't necessarily suit everyone and it's important that you, you you're working in an environment where you feel comfortable where you can flourish um, so you know it, it it sounds sort of maybe a bit fluffy but actually that's quite com quite fundamental because if you're not comfortable you have to go to your work every day we're all working remotely now but you know you've got to do it every day for a long time <laughs> so it's important that you feel happy and comfortable um so that was one one thing that i it took me a while to kind of get to grips with that um my other one as i said nothing's ever wasted i already mentioned that yeah. um and um yeah i think also you can you know push yourself to be the best that you can in whatever you're doing um but also be honest with yourself you know as i said at the start for me it was more about working out what i didn't want to do and i got to what i did want to do via that rather than having some kind of big you know epiphany moment <laughs> Um, so thinking about what topics really interest you rather than maybe what other people's agenda for you might be I think that's a big one as well actually I think I think I think you're absolutely right I think there's a lot of pressure on people to to meet certain sort of levels of success which society has decided rather than saying this is me this is what i want to do this is this is what what i like and i think your sort of self knowledge at the beginning to say an archaeology career might not bring the kind of structure and necessarily progression that i i want for myself i think was quite important to say actually okay you perhaps you miss archaeology but as you say you've got to have that kind of privileged knowledge of it throughout your career and actually i think we could do more to tell students that following your own path and, and not listening to what other people's notions of success are is actually really important. So that's really, really valuable advice to Yeah, given. I think that, that, that phrase, what does success mean for you? It's not always easy to answer that question, but you can keep asking yourself that question. And it is important to get other people's input, but not let it actually ultimately dictate because yeah, you're the one having to you're the one having to actually do the job every day when it comes to it yeah yes absolutely okay rosemary thank you so much for joining us today and taking time to speak to us you're welcome thank you as well to everyone for watching join us again next time for more top tips for archaeology graduates <laughs>